Part 2 of Chapter 14, Section A. So we're still in Italy, we're still in Rome, and I'm going to introduce you to your third person whose last name begins with B, an Italian name. Uh, there's so many of them, I know it's hard to keep them straight, but I hope you can. Um, and this is Francesco Borromini, and he's an architect. And just as Bernini was extremely innovative in the way he envisioned his sculptures, his inventiveness, so is Borromini in, in architecture. We're only going to really look at one of his structures, and that's this one. And this is San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane. And it was this little church built on an intersection of two streets. On each corner of this intersection, there was a fountain. So that's the four fountains of the Quattro Fontane. And the church is dedicated to uh, San Carlo or St. Charles. <clears throat> so if you just look at this now um, and compare it in your mind to some of the other churches we've seen, which you know would include Gothic cathedrals, it would include San Lorenzo in, in Florence. Um, this is way different. <clears throat> so it's got two levels. It's got some columns. It's got this undulating surface that you can see by looking at this balustrade up here, this, this uh, concave curve, and then it sort of swells in, it swells out. And it's got this uh, cartouche or this medallion that sort of angles out over the street so people could see it. A little tower in the corner and a dome back here. And this is the lantern over the dome. I'll show you that presently. This is the entrance. So what Borromini's doing here that is very different and very new is he's using a classical element, which you saw as soon as the slide went up these columns, these nice Corinthian columns, he's using a classical element in a new way. So he took it out of the context of that lineup of columns in the classical uh, temple facade, and he sticks them into this new creation. It looks kind of like a hodgepodge from here, and um, it really is kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, so Francesco designed the church of San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane in an irregular plot at an intersection. The facade of the church is filled with sculpture, including a forward-leaning cartouche held up by high-relief angels. And you can see them up there. The church was commissioned in 1634. The facade was finished in 1665, so it's quite a few years. Borromini, as creative in reimagining architectural form as Bernini was in sculpture. Uh, two triangles are the basis. The facade is very asymmetrical and curved and straight. Uh, the dome is very shallow, but it has the illusion of greater depth. So we're going to look at the interior now. Um, so very asymmetrical facade, I should point out too. Here's a plan of the church. Uh, so this is where that fountain is on the outside. So it kind of, it, it's very irregular in shape. The plan is very irregular. There's a tiny little cloister here, uh, just, which is just a courtyard really. Um, and some other rooms back in here, which we won't even look at. But this is the main nave of the church. And so you can see here Borromini's breaking more rules. He made his nave in an oval shape. Um, and we'll, we will look at the inside of that. It's very small, as I said. And here's the altar. Here in this plan, you can also see how the uh, facade of the church undulates with this inward curve, the outward curve. There's steps there, which are sort of hidden by the words church entrance and then another inward curve there. Um, so that's, that's the plan. Here's a view up into the dome of the church. And... The dome, as I said, was very shallow, but he makes it look deeper. He makes it look further away, very high up, um, by this sort of trick of the eye. He used these coffers, and the coffers you can see alternate between hexagons, octagons, and crosses. And he created these to grow very small, very dramatically small, 
towards the middle, which gives the illusion that they're further away. And they're, they're far away, but they're not that far away. In the center of this is this raised portion. So there's a hole in the dome and then this little cap over that with windows all around it. This is called a lantern. So uh, the lantern just allows sunlight in. And up in the roof of this little lantern, you can see again the motif of the bird with the golden rays streaming out from him. Um, that is the the dove of the Holy Spirit. So it's a symbol that is universal and is seen quite often, especially in Baroque art, is um, this representation of the Holy Spirit as a dove. Now, um, this is what the nave of the church looks like. So remember, it was oval shaped, very, very tiny, very intimate. Here you can see the pews, so uh, not very many people could sit in here at a time. It would just be the people in the neighborhood. Um, and up here is that dome, or the very bottom part of that dome, which begins. And he's using more columns on the inside, more Corinthian columns in a non-classical way. So this is a, a close look at the innovation of Francesco Borromini. And here's some more, because you really only get to look at that one church, but I, I cannot say it too much, how he reimagined, how very creative he was with buildings in Rome. And this is uh, one of his churches. This little lantern up here has this spiraling that goes up. Um, I think this might be that very dome, but I'm not completely sure. Um, but look at how this dome is created with these lobes. Um, so it's in six parts, but there's only three that are nice and round and two, three are angled. And over here is a close-up of another um, spiral lantern. And this one's more of a traditional, very Baroque-looking church. So this, this form of engaging classical elements becomes the norm um, throughout Europe for Baroque structures. So now we're going to look at a secular structure. This means it's not a church. It's not religious at all. The palace of the Farnese family contains a ceiling painted by Annibali Caracci. The ceiling creates the illusion of framed paintings, stone sculpture, nude youths, and other trompe l'oeil. Trompe l'oeil is just a French term that means fool the eye, um, and it means it's highly illusional. So the trompe l'oeil work inspired by the Sistine Chapel ceiling. The difference is that the work glows with a warm light and the subject is completely pagan. So this uh, Farnese family was actually the home of one of the cardinals. So they were a very high-ranking church family. They had a, a son who was a cardinal. Uh, cardinals are just right under the pope. It's usually a cardinal who gets elected to be the next pope. Um, so this is the facade of the palace, and I just want to point out, um, as before we look at the painting on the inside, that this was a Renaissance palace. So Renaissance, like the ones we saw in Florence, where they just had this very horizontal repetition of windows, um, this pattern unbroken, but the remodeling that occurred in the Baroque period was to create this centerpiece, this emphasis on the entryway. And that, that's the one thing that the Baroque brings is this, um, this emphasis of a portal. So, uh, Farnese Palace. And as I also said, this is now the French embassy. And you can kind of see the French flag and the European Union flag there. So this is the um, ceiling painting that I was describing here, the ceiling of a gallery in that same palazzo. And um, like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, he's divided, Caracci has divided the ceiling up into individual frames. But um, Michelangelo's ceiling had a very regular rhythm. All of the rectangular frames were the same size, and um, so it was just like a pattern. But here we have one center panel and then smaller ones on the side. Now you start to look at all the irregularities, the overlapping. Um, this becomes much more uh, irregular and sort of exciting in a way that Michelangelo's was 
was not, was more regular. The subject here, I think, is what is important, and this is the loves of the gods. So there's nothing here about Jesus. There is nothing about the Bible. There is nothing uh, about Christianity. It is all um, the loves of the Greek and Roman gods. And a lot of the stories, the myth, myths of Greek mythology, as you know, have to do with their romances. So I think it's an interesting subject to be found in the Cardinal's home. But uh, apparently they thought it was pretty cool. So um, this style of painting also, notice it because I'm we're going to see something very different happen. Where uh, figures, there's a lot of nudity, but the figures are fully fleshed, fully illuminated. There's no illusion. There's no dramatic shading at all. Everything is very bright. Now, um, up on the top, we have two details from that ceiling from the Farnese Palace, uh, where you can see the fake sculptures painted, and then some nudes that are made to look real, sort of lounging around here, lounging in the corner. So you have uh, complex framing, sculptures, paintings, etc. And down here is Michelangelo's, which clearly inspired Karachi, but he went off and did his own thing. Um, with the, the rectangular framing, the, the fake sculptures painted in. So you can see similarities, but you can also see how different Karachi is. Now, the idea of ceiling paintings takes off um, because it's super dramatic. It's dramatic to have some big, huge area uh, right above where people are sitting and doing something, showing some very dramatic scene. If it's up, you know, the logical subject would be heaven. And so um, several artists in the Baroque period paint ceilings in churches to depict or give the illusion that there's a hole in the ceiling and you can view directly from the pew up into heaven. So this is a painting by an artist named Gaudi, and it's the triumph in the name of Jesus. It's in the vault of the church of Il Gesù. Um, and it's very much in the spirit of Bernini. So architecture, sculpture, and painting produce a united illusion that appeals to viewers' emotions. So this is the imagined whole. All of this is uh, painted on a I believe it's all paint on a flat ceiling, but there are real sculptures here stuck on. Um, so there's both real and fake stuff here. Um, I think I have a, yeah, this, this is just to remind you of where this whole idea of this illusion, uh, illusion of a hole in the ceiling came from. It started um, with this artist with his, um, simple little skylight in the camera picta. So um, here's a close-up of that Gaudi painting and you can see the glowing center of that intense brightness um, and there are I believe the monogram of Jesus is in the center of this and there might be demons falling out of heaven. Notice how like figures have been giving these uh, shadings underneath to really simulate the fact that the, this is the source of light. And if you're turned away from that, if something's blocking you, you're going to be shaded. So it just intensifies in its illusion. And here's another one. This was now painted for a secular setting. This was the home of the Pope's family, the Barberini family the triumph of the Barberini. So the whole subject here is to show how God is blessing the Barberini family, that giving them special honor. And in it, you can see um, the three Bs of their, that's from their coat of arms, the Barberini's coat of arms. The papal tiara is... Um, Yes, this is it over here. It doesn't seem very central to me. Um, and there's people down on the side. See the fake sculptures here? Now you can see where um, the Karachi sort of picked up and things just go from there. It gets crazy. Um, 
and heaven opening up there. So this is in the house. Right. Nice. And here's another one. This is, I believe, your last one. This is by Fra Andrea Pozzo, The Glorification of St. Ignatius, a ceiling fresco in the nave of San Ignazio in Rome from the late 17th century. So to me, this is the ultimate because not only did the artist open a hole in the ceiling so you can see up into heaven, he painted a whole other layer of the building. So all of these columns, they're all fake, 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 fake. All these little niches and ledges that are occupied by these figures and whatever. Um, it's all just fake. But it's pretty amazing if you think about that. Um, I believe this is the one where there are some bad people falling down, being cast out of heaven, but I'm not real sure. You can see the cross in the middle being supported by the angels. Oh my goodness, so much, so much. But an artist who's striking a different path, and in this way I think is uh, being just as innovative with his painting as Bernini was with sculpture and Borromini was with architecture. So this is Caravaggio and I'm going to show you several paintings by him. He's an artist you will need to know for the quiz so pay attention. So the subject of Caravaggio in the 1590s includes still lifes and scenes of young men dressed as mythological figures um, and this I don't think of as the most important of Caravaggio's work. This is his very early work. But uh, after 1600, most of his commissions were for religious art. In the Contarelli Chapel, there are three large oil paintings on the subject of St. Matthew were produced in a studio instead of being painted as frescoes and on the, directly on the wall. <clears throat> so here are the three paintings, and um, I, you probably aren't going to notice what's really strikingly different. So we're going to talk in great depth about what Caravaggio did, how he reimagined painting. So the subject here the, uh, is St. Matthew, one of the disciples of Jesus. He also wrote the book of Matthew. And um, we're going to look at this one over here in detail. So they were painted on canvas and placed in the church instead of being painted on the walls. So that immediately gives them an advantage, an advantage that the artist is able to use oil paints, that the paint dries slowly. He can work uh, very meticulously. He's not in a rush because the plaster is wet and has to be painted. Um, and so you have all the advantages of oil and none of the disadvantages of um, fresco. So let's look at this painting. Um, this is Caravaggio at his best. So he does a lot of things that are extremely innovative in painting. And the first thing you probably notice is that he puts his figures in a dark setting. The room is dark and he uses very dramatic lighting. A single light source. So this is in contrast to Karachi. I just showed you the loves of the gods. And I said they're uniformly lit. Everybody was like there was light all over the place on them. Not so with Caravaggio. So we can even see on the wall over here a light source coming in and streaming down and hitting characters on one side of their heads. So another thing he does is he crops in. He eliminates all unnecessary elements of the setting. So um, figures are often right down on the very bottom of the picture plane. They're large in scale. There's nothing ex extra in here. It's all essential. He's cropped in. We don't know where this space is. Is there a large room over here? Or is this it? Are there other people in the background? Or not we don't know because it didn't matter he shows us the the core of the scene and this is what does matter so in this painting is Jesus and Jesus is shown here in a way that he has not been shown ever before he's a marginal figure he's not even illuminated 
This is Jesus. This guy here is covering him up. All we can see of Jesus, of Jesus is his head and his right arm. And he's reaching out to point to Matthew, saying, Hey, you, come with me. And it, I think this is Matthew. Matthew hasn't seen him yet. His head's down. Um, and, okay, I got to acknowledge the fact that these guys are supposed to be biblical figures, but they're all dressed like Italian uh, people in Rome, right? You just have to get past that. It's just sort of one of the things that artists do. And we saw this in the early Renaissance as well. Uh, Jesus may have the hint of the suggestion of a halo here, but it's not real sure. So we have this dark setting, we have this dramatic lighting, and there's a special term for the dramatic lighting. It'll show up in the text of another slide, and you will need to know that for the quiz. Um, let's move on. Is the gesture of Jesus' hand uh, meant to echo this gesture of Adam from the Sistine Chapel? Uh, that, I didn't make this connection. Somebody else did. But just have to remind you that both of these paintings are in Rome, that Caravaggio was working in Rome, and he could have gone into the Sistine Chapel and seen this at any time, and undoubtedly he did. He was familiar. He must have been familiar with it. So here's another uh, Caravaggio. This is the entombment where it shows a group of Jesus' followers who are placing him down into a tomb. He is now imagining the tomb as being a hole in the ground and not a cave, as many artists do. The dramatic part here um, is everything that I've told you about. We have the dark background. We have dramatically lighted figures. Um, we're not sure what the light source is, but we know that there's a very strong light source and it casts strong shadows on the dark side of the figures. But this uh, painting would have been raised up, probably the viewer's eye level would be about here. So as you're standing in front of this painting and you're looking at it, you have to imagine that you are standing in the hole that Jesus is about to be lowered into. He's trying to create that illusion even by, by pointing this big stone slab and making it look like it's jutting out into your space. And this is all to make you feel this painting intensely. And this is the Baroque, this drama, this intense emotion. Um, and Caravaggio was criticized because one of his style elements is that he makes figures look really real. He makes them look grubby, dirty, like street people. This man has on no shoes. He's bare feet. People would have criticized this because this is not how you paint saints. Um, but this was Caravaggio's style. And he got a lot of commission. And, and today I'd say he's the single most famous Italian Baroque painter. So here's another Caravaggio. This is the blinding of Paul on the road to Damascus where um, Paul had been persecuting Christians. God struck him blind. He fell off of his horse. He's on the ground blind. So Caravaggio just crops right into that scene, shows us the horse, some man with the horse. In fact, it looks like the same uh, model that was in the entombment picture. And he puts Paul's head right up against the bottom of the frame to bring him into our space so we identify with Paul. Um, and we don't know where that light source is, but you can tell that this the rear end of the horse is in the shade. That's another one. And here, uh, one of my favorite Caravaggios, this is John the Baptist. And we just see this beautiful youth uh, sitting and thinking out in the wilderness somewhere. He's uh, just got a red robe dramatically wrapped around him. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting, beautiful figure. But another one of my favorite Caravaggios is this one, and it's the uh, Kiss of Betrayal. So this is Jesus here. And this shows the moment when Judas has led the Roman soldiers into the courtyard and has gone over to Jesus to kiss him on the cheek, 
to identify him for the Romans so they will arrest him and take him off for trial and crucifixion. So the, the thing I love about this is how Caravaggio brings our attention to these two heads right here and then shows this great sad expression on Jesus's face. Um, just like he knows, he knows it's over. And he's very sad that Judas has turned on him. This is the end of part two of 14a. So again, stay tuned. There's more to come.